All right. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, morning. depending on where you are joining us from. It is so wonderful to see so many people here. We are very excited for this session today. And we are going to dive in shortly. We have had so much interest um, from so many individuals with lots of questions. And we have about 100 years of experience in the veterinary and financial space um, on our panel today. So I'm really excited to introduce you to everybody and to get going. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Marie Holowaychuk. I am CEO and founder of Reviving Veterinary Medicine, and of course, a passionate advocate for well-being in the veterinary space. I want to um, give a big shout out to our sponsor today, TD, for hosting, um, sponsoring this session. And um, it's just so great to finally have a sit down conversation to talk about these important questions for those who are considering considering practice ownership. So today we'll be, we will be focusing on building or buying a practice, where to begin. Session two will be in a couple of weeks, owning a practice, how do I thrive? This is a common concern for a lot of female veterinarians in terms of how do I balance all of this? Is it possible? And, and spoiler alert, yes, it is. We'll be talking about that. And then our last session in June will be on retiring from practice, how do we transition? So I'm going Going to um, take a moment here to briefly introduce each one of our experts today, um, beginning with the wonderful Shannon Gervais. Shannon's professional journey began in client-facing positions in veterinary nursing, pharmaceutical sales, marketing, and management. This diverse background instilled in her a passion for continuous learning and ho a holistic understanding of business operations. Now she focuses on operations, business development, and change management within the veterinary industry. Advocating for an employee-centric approach, Shannon prioritizes the inside-out method, ensuring that teams' needs are met to drive the success of the business. Committed to fostering positive workplace cultures, she is actively pursuing professional membership with the Association of Change Management Professionals to further enhance her multi-passionate career trajectory. So welcome, Shannon. We are so Thank glad to Marie. have you. We also have Ramel Rupshand, who is has over 17 years in banking and has spent the last six years providing financial solutions for healthcare and business professionals. Ramel has developed strong expertise and knowledge of the industry to bring solutions that meet the banking needs of healthcare and business professionals, no matter what stage of career they're in. Ramel takes pride in providing timely advice to his professional customers and together with his team is committed to helping you along the path to success. He is also a proud fur papa to two cute little dogs named Sophia, a toy Pomeranian, and Rosie, a teacup poodle. So thank you so much, Ramel, and welcome as well. Okay. Okay. So next, whoops, sorry. Get my so next we have Mansi Patel with over 20 years of experience in banking. Mansi has developed the expertise and industry knowledge to work with healthcare and business professionals in providing them solutions to meet their goals at every stage. Mansi and her team at TD are committed to working with veterinarians by taking the time to understand their business and advising them on tailored solutions throughout their career. In her spare time, Mansi enjoys cooking and experimenting with vegan food for family and friends. Love that. Okay, welcome, Mansi. Thank you. And last but most certainly not least, we have Ross Aberdeen. With over 30 years in banking, Ross has spent the majority of his career as a mid-market commercial banker. He has spent the last eight years specializing in solutions for healthcare and business professionals, providing expert advice and custom-tailored solutions. Whether you're in school, starting out into your career, exploring practice ownership, or looking towards retirement. Ross is also a proud pooch parent to Guinness, an eight-year old Shipu and spent a large part of his youth on family farms in the gray country area of Ontario. So welcome, Ross. Wonderful to have you with Thanks, us. Thanks, Marie. 
Okay, so for those of you who are joining us live, I welcome you um, to please go ahead and share uh, your information in the chat, whatever feels comfortable to you. We would love to know where um, where you are coming, uh, joining us from, um, what role you are in in practice to date. And um, we, in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and get started with questions from our panel of experts. So um, let me pull up our questions here. We got so many wonderful questions. And the first question is going to go over to Ross. And again, those of you who are tuning in, please feel welcome to share any questions that come up in the chat. And I will do my best to, to insert those as well. OK, so question for Ross. What do I need to consider if I'm thinking about getting into practice ownership, whether starting a new hospital or buying an existing one? Geez, I think I could speak to that for the whole next hour, but <laughs> <laughs> it, that's a really, really common one. You know, whether you just got out of school last year, you've been uh, working for somebody else for the last five years, 10 years, maybe even, um, you really need to set out what your personal and life goals are and how is starting a practice can Im impact those goals. You know, what really is important to you? Uh, purchasing a house, uh, settling down, starting a family, uh, maybe moving back closer to where you originally hailed from or finding a new part of the world to, uh, uh, to explore and, and lay your roots down. Um, understand what your current debt situation is. Uh, both personal and business debts, and how much will I need to make to pay my debts? Uh, a big financial obligation, whether you're starting a practice or buying an established one, established practices aren't getting any cheaper, as most of you know, and the cost of building out a practice uh, with inflationary pressures and uh, equipment costs going up isn't getting any cheaper either. Consider how you're going to complete the ancillary functions of, the, of your business, the bookkeeping, the HR, the IT, the social media, and everything else. And start thinking about the whole process. Uh, do your research, understand the market where you want to establish yourself. How big do I want my practice to be? Where do I want it to be located? Is it a good location and why? Um, and, you know, can I add any other additional services over time once I start to grow? And that's, you know, the same sort of consideration whether you're buying or starting a practice. And a big question is as well, do you want to do it on your own or do you want to do it with a partner? Um, that's a really tough question to consider. You know, you may look at bringing in other vets and be your own boss and, and own the practice yourself. Uh, you may have somebody you're very close with that you worked with or went to school with that you may want to establish something with, uh, but be very, very cautious about uh, partnerships. Uh, uh, they... Whenever money is involved, whether it's family or friends, it always, uh, you know, takes an extra dose of caution there. And find a mentor, somebody that has owned practices in the past, whether it's starting them up or acquiring them, figure out what they do well and what you think you could do even better and take advantage of the advisors that are out there can that can help you explore those options and assist with the due diligence. I always joke, you know, I, we were the business school kids, vets, doctors, et cetera. You guys were the science kids. Um, I didn't go to law school. I always, whenever I need the advice of a lawyer, don't try to Google it. I get a lawyer to help me, whether that's doing a will or uh, whatever the case is uh, and a good accountant who understands the vet space as well. Um, there's a lot to really consider uh, uh, you know, start early. It, it, those th thought process has to make sense to you. Um, you know, whether or not you want to lease a location, buy a location, you talk to those advisors. They can help provide you that advice and, and, and start building that plan out early. And once that plan makes sense to you, then more than likely, you know, it's going to be a very viable option. I think I covered that off, Marie. <laughs> yeah, that that was awesome, Ross. So, it's, I mean, it sounds like it's really about a lot of networking and getting a lot of experts around you and, and opening up these conversations, seeking advice. One of the questions that we received from one of our res registrants 
asked, what are your recommendations for newer vets considering practice ownership within the next five to 10 years in terms of that planning or preparation? And I know it's like a whole lot to consider. What would you offer as like the most logical first step if they were just to start somewhere in this journey? Because of course, this doesn't happen overnight. This is years in the making. Yeah. Find a mentor, find a good banker, find a good accountant and a good lawyer. You might not need a lot of their services up front, but over time you're going to be able to use them sounding boards. They're going to be able to, you can tap into their wealth of experience, uh, particularly uh, you're making sure that those individuals have a great understanding of the veterinary industry as well. Um, and bring in folks like yourself who can help with, you know, the other aspects around it. And, uh, it, you know, it, your plan is probably going to change 10 times before you finally find exactly what you want to do and what works for you. You may think you want to start up something from scratch and then find that great opportunity three years from now uh, for an acquisition uh, that makes a lot of sense for you. And uh, but yeah, it, it, it get that legwork started as soon as you think that that might be an option for you and uh, don't rush it either. Uh, don't hesitate. Uh, you know, you're, uh, 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 you can always end up in analysis paralysis, we call it at the bank, where you look at something so many times, you can't figure out what the real answer is. But, um, you know, it, it's going to take time, you want to plan it out properly. And uh, don't be afraid uh, to keep moving forward. Super helpful advice. Thank you so much, Ross. Uh, getting more into the nitty gritty, this next question is for Rommel. When should I engage my bank to discuss financing? Um, I think uh, engaging a bank uh, probably process might start as soon as possible. Um, you know, you want to understand your financial situation. Um, you want to know what is feasible, what, it, what you can afford. Um, and so when you're going out there and you're looking for a space or you're looking to figure out how big you want to build the practice. Um, you know, talking to us can help you understand what uh, is financially possible for you. Uh, you don't want to, um, you know, bite off a little bit more than you can chew. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of considerations, which what Ross touched upon, you know, like, do I buy a building? Do I lease a building? You know, those, those are also big, big considerations. That's a big chunk of money that you will spend too as well. Um, and how big do I build up my practice? Um, what does that look like? And then we can always uh, connect you once again with the lawyers, with experts such as uh, Shannon Marie too, as well, to help you think of all of the, uh, you know, all of the components that will go into building out, uh, you know, a really um, successful practice. So engaging a banker uh, will start as soon as possible, um, you know, having a strong banking relationship. And this could also help you move fast on a certain deal that you might be looking at. Um, uh, you know, you don't want to engage a banker afterwards and you've signed a commitment for, you know, buying a practice or buying a, you know, uh, a real estate that might not be within, you um, your financial reach. So we want to make sure that everything works for you and you're not, um, and, and you're not stressing about money or paying the, paying that loan that you're focusing more on patient, uh, your, your patient, uh, that, that come into the practice. Yeah. Really helpful advice getting started soon. So that should that opportunity arise, you're not like scrambling <laughs> to try yeah, to start. Exactly. In. I love that. Nancy, uh, the question I have for you is, what would the bank need if I am starting to look at my own buying, uh, starting my own veterinary practice, excuse me, what would the bank need if I'm looking to start my own veterinary practice? And how would that differ if I want to buy an existing practice? So sure. what is the bank going to be asking for? Yeah, that's actually a great question. Again, uh, it opens up a a whole thing of question answers that we can give, but um, you know, it segues great from what my colleague Romel was touching on that once you already have someone engaged uh, from the banking, they're able to give you some, um, I guess, flavor of what kind of things to look up for when you're ready out in the market to look for a practice. Do I start? Do I own? Um, so what is it that your banker will need once you're ready to make the first step? So I'll answer first half of the question, uh, which is how and what we need um, when you're starting 
starting a practice would be um, uh, an accountant prepared business plan with financial statements. Um, that's why it's good to have, you know, uh, Ross mentioned a great accountant and a lawyer to work with, um, your personal net worth form, uh, personal notice of tax assessments, um, T1 general tax filings, if you had your own personal uh, VPC where you were earning your billings from, um, and then a CV outlining your skills. Uh, you would have a lease agreement if you're not buying the real estate, we would need to take a look at that to review uh, and then the purchase and sale agreement if there is one uh, available there and then having these items ready uh, will help your banker essentially just uh, give you a faster turnaround and get you a proposal, which uh, we'll, we can touch on uh, after and go into details and then for an existing practice we would um, need all of those but we would instead of a business plan in certain cases we will need, but we'll also need an appraisal. So I know there's lots of great appraisers out there um, that could uh, you know, assess the practice and then from there on we collect and return that back with a, in a form of a financing proposal for you. Excellent, that's very helpful. Um, Mansi, you mentioned a business plan. Um, as a non-business minded individual, I'm gonna turn it over to Ross to ask uh, what, what is needed in a business plan? What should be included? Oops, I just realized I was on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> in that business plan, you want to basically lay out who you are as a practitioner, what you're bringing to the table, um, what services are you looking to offer? Um, you know, what type of veter veterinary medicine uh, are, are you proposing uh, you're gonna uh, uh, offer in your clinic? Um, outline how you're gonna market yourself and how you're gonna differentiate yourself from uh, uh, other vets that may be in competition with you in a particular area um, and provide a snapshot of that competition. Um, who is your management team going to be? Uh, uh, who are those other employees going to be within that clinic? And have you already found those people? Um, you're going to need that financial data that uh, uh, from your accountant that, that makes sense not only to your accountant, but makes sense to you as well. That's going to lay out how many uh, uh, patients you're going to see per day, um, how many you plan to see in the first week versus in the next month, through three months, through six months, through the end of the first year, out into the second year. And it's also going to lay out exactly um, what all those assumptions are around there too. Now, the business plan is a living, breathing document that really is more intended for you as an entrepreneur than it is for the bank. It's very important to the bank. That's the document that's going to give us the faith to lend you the money to start up that practice. But at the end of the day, it's going to be a living, breathing document that you're going to use to launch your business, to get through that first year of operations, to sit down at the end of that first year and reflect upon and say, what did we do well? What could we improve on? What went phenomenally well and maybe we forget about this idea and focus on that idea because uh, uh, one thing worked and the other didn't really that business plan once you are confident in it and have convinced yourself that that concept is viable and that those numbers work you're likely not going to have a problem uh, uh, once you uh, sit down with your banker and go through those fine points um, because that confidence is going to show that it's well thought out, that, uh, uh, you know, it's never going to be perfect, but uh, you shouldn't have a problem convincing a banker once that is presented into them, uh, if you've really put honest thought into it and uh, are confident in, in your concept for your clinic. That's super helpful. I, it's so interesting because when I think of business plan, I think it's just like a bunch of numbers and how am I going to, you know, show profits, but it really is the whole vision that you have for your practice and who's going to be a part of that. So um, I love that. And I love that you um, reinforce that it's a living document so it can change as things um, move on. Speaking of change, Shannon, um, I want to turn it over to you. We've had a really good question from Sarah in the chat, and it kind of dovetails off of one of the questions that we had, a couple of questions actually we had from registrants before. Um, so if you do choose to start your own practice, what considerations are needed in relation to the business plan? So when thinking of like that vision that you have and, and your mission and values, um, maybe we'll start there and then I've got some others to follow. 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is my favorite topic. So, I mean, I always say that there's traditionally, you know, the the typical structure of the business plan that Ross already went over, but it's including not limited to the executive summary, company description, product services, all the things that Ross was talking about. One of the things that I like to emphasize the importance on in your business plan is making sure to establish the importance of the mission statement, the values, and the culture right from the start. So I refer to this as the softer side, yet equally important part of your business plan. Um, and this is often the best part of your business plan, and it is crucial to get this right. So in a veterinary practice setting, defining that culture, mission, and values right from the start, like I said, is essential. So not just as formalities, but this is the core framework guiding your operations and strategy. So at the end of the day, your revenue. So these elements should be thoroughly embedded in your business plan and detail how they will influence hiring, your customer interactions, and the overall workplace environment. So your clear mission statement, for example, should reflect your commitment to animal care and community service. While your values, they might highlight compassion, excellence, and integrity, for example. So I like to include those core principles in business plans and help align your team with the practice's goals and set those clear expectations for everyone involved right from the beginning. Um, these are actually really important things and the bank likes to see these things as well because they know that you know half, happy staff, happy team members, it equals a, a very integrated approach um, to the overall business. So alignment for this is crucial for recruiting and retaining the right staff, as well as for building positive community reputation, which is something super important. <laughs> so in summary, with all of that, um, culture, mission, values, it's not just about creating a pleasant workspace, um, but laying out that foundation so that it ensures long-term sustainability and competitiveness, getting that into a document, and even going as far as hiring a professional to help navigate this discussion with your team. Once your team is assembled, that is a critical part in establishing some of those key parameters for success. That's so helpful, Shannon. Um, you know, as a well-being advocate, I often get called into practices when they're having problems with toxicity and, and culture and communication. And we almost have to like rewind time and go totally. back to like, what is our ideal experience for the team and for the customer or the client? And how do we do that? Maybe we've got some values like on our website, but we're not actually clear as a team about how that translates into everyday behavior. So um, I love that. I think it's so important. So I want to build off of that because that, of course, is our ideal situation when we're starting a practice. How does this differ from buying an existing practice? We've had a couple of questions. I know Sarah had a great question in the chat about change management and, and that sort of thing. We've had a lot of questions submitted uh, separately as well around like, if I, if there is, you know, a, a selling of the practice, how do I get my team on board? How do I get them to buy in? Could you speak to those situations? Absolutely. So I, I, I've summed it down into four essential steps. Um, so I'll, I'll just go over those. So number one, detailed due diligence. So beyond just culture, I stress the importance of conducting thorough due diligence when inquiring an existing practice. So this includes everything from reviewing financial records. And of course, there's people that will help you with that. Um, client retention rates, employee satisfaction and compliance, um, compliance with current veterinary standards and practices. And if you don't feel comfortable um, like going through an evaluation like that, there are resources available. There's a great team at my vet group group of my friends, they're wonderful. They love to help assess um, for stuff like that. So that's number one. So number one, detailed due diligence. So number two, strategic synergies, I like to call it. So discuss how to evaluate um, those synergies between your own goals and the existing practices capabilities. So for example, 
if you specialize as a DVM in a particular area of veterinary medicine, how well does that existing practice support your specialization or what would need to be added? This is just an example of what those synergies can look like. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really important thing to consider and also some of the things that you might be interested in doing for the future. How would that add um, to the practice in their synergies that are already existing? So number three would be community engagement. I'm a huge proponent of community engagement. So talking uh, um, and understanding the role of the practice currently within the community and how you would integrate or elevate those relationships. Community trust and loyalty can be significant assets or challenges when taking on an existing practice. And number four is where the change management comes in. So this is, it's a transition plan, a plan, sorry. So expanding, um, you know, understanding what change management is, is essential. They're gone are the days of, you know, oh, hey, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to change this major thing that we've been doing for the last 20 years and everybody has to do it because I said so. That doesn't work anymore. It shouldn't have worked back then. Um, but it's important to understand what change management is. And change management is about supporting the people, supporting the team for anything that you want to do that's a major transition. So such as acquiring a practice and becoming a new practice owner of an existing practice that's a huge transition for that team. So, you know, get a professional involved, get somebody that understands how to do this properly and include, you know, stuff like staff orientations. It's the community as well. Like you're a new practitioner that's coming in there. It's going to be different for the community. So what does that change look like for the community? Um, and just add these phases of change um, progressively and with a lot of thought to avoid disruption. Um, this can also be, you know, super important for maintaining legacy practices um, and ensuring that really smooth transition happens. So again, um, if, if you're unfamiliar of how to do change management um, effectively and transitioning get professionals involved. There are so many resources. You can reach out to Marie and myself and we'll help you with that. It's uh, it's something really important where we need to continue to support each other with these types of things. That's so helpful, Shannon. Um, Tom shared in the comments, totally agree. And Shannon, important to have your culture values in writing, even in the form of SOPs to hold the team manager and owners accountable. And that's right. Everybody is held accountable. It's not just the team, but the ownership exactly. as well. A hundred percent. I love what you shared. Thank you so much. Well, oh, you accidentally muted. Sorry. Thank you. We've had a few questions coming up around um, uh, financing, uh, lease terms, and so on. Ramo, I'm going to start with this question, and then I think this dovetails into a question that okay. Steve yeah. put in the chat. Um, if I am financing my practice, what lease terms do I need for financing? Yeah, typically when we're financing, the lease should match the term, the term of the lease should match the loan amortization. So for example, if we're going to uh, do a loan of, let's say 10 years, uh, the lease term should be 10 years, at least, uh, you know, you could do a five plus five, uh, you know, five year lease term with an option for you to renew um, five years, for example. Um, and that gives the bank comfort knowing that you have a space secured for that time, the loan will be there. Um, there are certain situations too, as well, where we can, we, we are very um, uh, uh, creative and knowledgeable around leases where we can look at some of the nuances of uh, leases where, you know, some landlords are getting very tricky with their terms and the bank uh, can look at working with uh, uh, with these leases to arrange your financing. Um, you know, we've, we work with lease professionals too, as well. And I would recommend that uh, you as well, uh, hire a lease professional to work for you as well, because that landlord has a lawyer that drafted up a really ironclad lease. And uh, a lot of times I see a lot of veterinarians, uh, doctors, dentists just sign a lease without any representation on their part. And these leases tend to be very prohibitive um, in, in, in uh, their ability to operate their business or even sell their business uh, without compensating the uh, landlord. 
Um, so you want to hire somebody who represents you. Now back to the question of what the lease terms are for the bank. Demolition clauses also play a big um, uh, a big part in in a lease too as well, and that can inhibit your ability to get a, 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 a or arrange financing. Uh, for example, it, it, it has to be property specific. So if we see, um, you know, for example, uh, a condo uh, was built and they have residential or sorry, commercial uh, spaces in the uh, main main area on the main level. And there is a demolition clause there that says in a year we will demolish this space. Realistically, is that going to happen? Um, no, the bank will look at that, uh, you know, from, you know, that lens, like what is the probability of this? Uh, um, of this uh, facility being demolished in the next year or so. Um, but if it's in, a, um, in an area where it's prime for redevelopment and there's a demolition clause, the bank might take a different view of that too as well. Um, but we also look at things like anchor tenants and uh, you know the banks uh, work with a lot of other um, businesses too as well and we can understand if they have leases and what those leases look like or if this is just a general clause within the uh, lease agreement that the landlord put in there to give them a little bit more stronger uh, position but having a lease uh, expert on your side too as well will help to ensure that the terms also are beneficial to you and not just the landlord. Okay, that makes sense. And, and that addresses um, the question that Steve had in the chat. Um, Mansi, just along those lines of, of buildings and so on, um, one of the questions we received is, what if I want to buy the real estate my practice is in? Yeah, no, absolutely. So the real estate, um, sometimes uh, we, you know, for veterinarians, first off, we actually can do up to 100% of uh appraisal or the purchase price um, that's uh, out on the table. Now, that could mean that where you operate your actual clinic off of and where you occupy all of the real estate um, uh, that you're purchasing. There are times where we see um, you may have a, you have more space than you actually require to operate your clinic and you are occupying. So the minimum requirement that we ask is about 50% occupancy from your clinic on there. And um, the rest could be tenants. So sometimes you have residential on top or you have other commercial tenants on the side that you would like to rent that out to. So, um, you know, having 50% occupancy on the real estate will also allow the bank to provide the 100% financing on the real estate um, for them. So there's different scenarios, obviously, um, that can come up in, in different situations on a case to case. Uh, but having um, a conversation with us will definitely um, help in us uh, customizing that solution for you on the real estate. Great. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Um, Ross, I'm going to ask a question to you that Brendan asked in the chat. Um, it is, there are a number of new companies that have funded clinics through both bank loans and private equity venture funds. How does a bank look at the debt financing when you begin to blend in capital from other areas like private equity and venture capital? Yeah, it, everybody knows that we're seeing more and more corporate interest in the veterinary space and these large entities from, you know, whether they're private uh, equity funded or coming from other venture capital sources, and in some cases, uh, uh, publicly listed companies in other parts of the world uh, who are coming in and paying rather inflated prices for practices, which are in a lot of ways putting, uh, making it tougher for the average veterinarian to find a good practice that uh, that they can acquire, because often those are uh, uh, are going to be the targets of the corporates. Um, we often aren't going to look at them the way that we would look at, you know, the the average vet buying their first practice or even their second practice where we would be able to provide, you know, 100% financing, typically amortized out 10 to 12 years uh, at a very, very attractive interest rate in most cases. We're going to be looking at what that overall, what we refer to in banking as leverage uh, uh, would look like. Um, we're going to be looking at what that total debt load is versus that free cash flow, that profit uh, after or before taxes and depreciation and those other elements. EBITDA, we refer to it as 
um, we want to make sure that that is uh, in a fairly controlled and a lower level than in a lot of cases we would see uh, uh, in a practice acquisition where you're buying that one practice. Um, from a pricing standpoint, typically uh, those deals uh, aren't going to be at as low of an interest rate. And it really comes down to our being able to secure ourselves. Uh, uh, very often the private equity firms take an ownership stake where we're just providing debt financing and looking for a rate of return there and are essentially going to want to have security over that group of practices and any of the related entities that tie in there accordingly. So um, it, if you want to talk to me about it a little bit further, Brandon, I'm happy to, uh, you're welcome to reach out to me after the fact and we can talk about it a little further, but we have great experience uh, in, the, in the healthcare space and dealing with private equity firms and other larger corporate players, uh, as well as those individual vets that uh, are looking to buy or start up that first practice. So yeah, happy to take that offline, Brennan, and uh, discuss it further with you. Great. Thanks so much, Ross. Um, I've got some other really great questions um, that relate to this, um, you know, concern about uh, competing with the corporate off uh, the offerings that are being made by corporate entities um, and some other things. So I'm going to open this question up to um, whomever feels comfortable. Um, but one of the questions submitted was, how can an individual hope to cope or sorry, compete with the high prices being offered to practice owners by corporations? Maybe I'll start off on that one. It's a tough one. Um, we're seeing those values get, uh, uh, they've been inflated since the pandemic and uh, we don't see that much moderation, but we still are seeing more and more practice owners who don't want to sell out to the corporate entities. They want to preserve their legacy, whether that's passing it uh, uh, along to an associate that has been working with them for several years or somebody else they know many would you're still a seller is still going to get a good dollar for it, which is going to be from a you know, looking at it from the bank's perspective, we're going to be limited uh, in how we can find the amount we can finance uh, based on the ability to serve as debt. That's the biggest thing that we look at. Once you pay yourself as the purchaser, what's left over to service the, the debt load of the practice and deal with any hiccups along the way, new equipment that needs to be upgraded, et cetera. But we are finding more and more that, and, and we see this in a lot of corporate healthcare, um, people just don't want to sell out to a corporate. Typically that seller is going to have to stay on for a number of years to work for them. Um, and they don't get all their money out up front. Uh, they often have to uh, keep some of those chips on the table uh, to the corporate side wants to ensure the performance of that seller out over that five-year term. And, uh, you know, many are happy to sell to uh, uh, either privately or through a broker to an individual vet uh, because they just don't want to uh, uh, sell to the corporate. So there still is opportunity out there. And it's just a case of networking, talking to people, um, getting to know those who you think may be in a position where they want to sell in the next few years. Maybe there's an employment opportunity for you there that uh, can lead to a partnership and eventually full ownership of that clinic down the road. Yeah, uh, just to touch a little bit on that. And uh, uh, Ross mentioned the, uh, the you know, very uh, strong point about uh, it's a, you know, when the seller is selling, there's also a, a legacy uh, component to it. And Shannon touched on that too, as well. Um, and especially in, you know, smaller communities too, as well, outside of, let's say, for example, GTA, uh, uh, Calgary, or um, the bigger markets like Vancouver, um, the other communities outside of them, uh, you know, the, the veterinarians have spent an amount of time developing relationships within that community and selling to a corporate who may not carry on that vision that the practice or that experience uh, that practice has had in the, uh, you know, in the community over the years might not be, uh, you know, a, a advantageous for that uh, veterinarian. And they're still going to live in the community, right? They're still going to have to run into the same people that they service, uh, you know, over time. So, uh, they, a lot of times what we see is they, um, they're looking for the right uh, buyer uh, uh, for their practice, not just the highest bidder too as well, um, because sometimes they, they're, they're, you know, their legacy is worth a little bit more than, you know, what somebody's willing to pay for. Yeah, and Tom just brought up a really great point in the, uh, the chat that 
very often the corporates are looking for the larger practices that spin mm -hmm. off a lot more profit. And there's still a great opportunity with those smaller practices for the individual purchaser. Good call, Tom. I want to just follow up with a question um, for Shannon that is kind of along these lines and just thinking of options. I know a lot of individuals and I have classmates of mine who've gone into partnerships with other veterinarians to purchase a practice so that the onus is not all on one individual financially. Um, Shannon, I would love to hear your thoughts on the pros and cons of that and what to consider if an individual wants to have that security um, or you know, just that um, camaraderie in going in and purchasing a practice or building a practice. No, oh, that's, it's a great question and one that I've talked to people about quite a bit. So um, I like to say it's like a marriage. So, you know, and in some marriages, maybe not all of them, um, but you should have uh, basically like a prenup, right? So you need a good lawyer. Um, so even if you're best friends, um, you could be you know, um, father and son, uh, mother and daughter, like whatever that looks like. Um, and we kind of touched on it a little bit in the beginning, when it comes to money, you just want to have everything laid out. So it's not to say that, you know, you, you, you know, couldn't pick a business partner that you've only known for a year or that you could pick a business partner that you've known for 40 years. It doesn't make any difference, but it just making sure that you are set up for success, um, making sure that you have a lawyer um, that understands um, the intricacies of this relationship and business partnership and laying everything out. Um, so every possible scenario, like even if it's like, oh my gosh, it's the worst possible thing I could think of. Um, so-and-so gets into a car accident, like every scenario that you can think of gets put into that business or that um, lawyer's document, like your prenup, um, that will help mitigate those risks in the future. Should somebody have a change of heart, should there be any kind of um, challenges with the relationship and so on. So just really doing your due diligence on that piece. And if you're not sure, reach out to people, like I said, um, you know, Marie and I have a huge network. TD has a huge network as well. <clears throat> Pardon me. But we're all here to support um, veterinarians, um, veterinary technicians, um, anybody getting into this space uh, as far as ownership, entrepreneurship, that kind of thing. So uh, that's what we're all about. And we like to support uh, the team. So thank you, Shannon. Wow. Um, I've got a couple of other finance related questions, but I'm going to jump over to Sarah's question that just came up in the chat. This is a good one. Buying a practice is such a big decision for veterinarians or RVTs. From the panel's perspective, what are the biggest barriers to these prof professionals buying their own practice? And how would you advise those who are hesitant? Such a juicy question. <laughs> Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and speak to one thing very quickly, because when it comes to this, this is something I'm hugely passionate on. Um, I believe that that veterinarian and RVT relationship is just one that is absolutely incredible when it comes to business partnerships. We're starting to see quite a bit more of that happening um, within all the provinces, and I love it. Um, so I, you know, really the biggest thing is, you know, how much from an RVT standpoint, how much are you allowed to own? Um, so in most cases within Canada, it's about 49% with the majority being owned by the DVM. So you just, again, have to make sure that the prenup looks really good and, and, and have that all laid out properly. Um, so that, that is like a bit of a hurdle. The other thing is, is that for all of us in the veterinarian or RVT space, whatever that looks like the whole reason we're here today is because we you know we went to school we're, we're like the science geeks right so we're not the business geeks and and that's sorry guys um, <laughs> it's, um it's it's really important and it's scary it's really scary for us to take those leaps and you know, again, it's just coming down to that network and make sure that you are talking to the right people, um, non-biased, all of that. So reach out again. There's lots of people that can help. Yeah, if I can build off of that, Shannon, that's uh, you you stole my tagline there uh, <laughs> with the science and the business geeks. I love it. Um, you know, I think one of the big things we see and I've known vets and dentists and optometrists who I've spoken to for years, who have kicked tires on starting a practice and kicked tired on, on purchasing practices. 
and you realize eventually that you know it, it, some of them eventually gain that confidence through and through that process they brought on people that can help them and mentor them and give them advice that builds up that com uh, confidence that gets them past that hesitancy and in the same token, not everybody is cut from the same entrepreneurial cloth. I've got people that I went to school with that have gone on to great things in business and running their own enterprises and other people like me who are more than happy working for a bank and having a great career working for somebody else. We're not all cut from that same entrepreneurial cloth. And, you know, if you don't feel that that's something that's cut out for you, it doesn't need to be. There is nothing wrong with ending your day and going home and letting somebody else deal with the HR issues and getting the payroll done and negotiating with the suppliers and, you know, showing up at two in the morning because, uh, you know, shingles blew off the roof in a windstorm and, and the alarm went off, whatever the case is, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, you're your own best judge around that. And the more mentorship and help you can get along the way to build that confidence up and get beyond that hesitancy. And also the self-reflection to realize that not everybody is, like I said, cut from the same cloth and, and, uh, and maybe practice ownership isn't something that is best suited for you. But that's, uh, yeah, something that, you know, once you have that mentorship and that support and the people to help you uh, advise you, it's something you can go into with your eyes wide open and both feet in the pool. And this is definitely something we're going to touch more on in our next session when we talk more about how, how you know, female veterinarian practice owners and RVTs for that sake can still thrive while owning a practice. It can feel very daunting and there's opportunities for securing that mentorship, networking, um, getting that good support group around you. So we're going to be really leaning into that next week. So please, um, not next week, in a couple of weeks. So please do um, join us for that discussion as well. Um, it looks like we lost Ramel, and I was going to ask him the next question. So um, yeah, he just I'll, had a little uh, bit of a glitch, but that's yeah, fine. I think we, we lost. Him. I'm sure he'll be back. Um, I want to um, ask a few more um, detailed questions that have come up, uh, and again, to whomever feels comfortable answering. The question, one of the questions I received is: Is there financially profitable opportunities to start a new clinic? in the current volatile economy with high interest rates? I'll take that one yeah. if you don't mind, Mitzi. Sure, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know, really at the end of the day, um, we still, for the most part, see startup veterinary practices thrive in short order. Most banks will allow an interest-only period to allow you to get cash flow positive, not have to repay that principal uh, uh, so that you can get your feet under you in the practice and uh, uh, become cash flow positive and the ability to pay yourself. Uh, oftentimes, we will recommend at the outset, uh, don't quit your day job. Day one, you've probably done a great job of advanced marketing yourself and you've got some patients lined up and uh, you know your revenues will progress. But keep a part-time position uh, uh, open for yourself to be able to have some backup income. Um, banks will always look favorably when you have uh, a personal debt situation that is very manageable. So you've got some flexibility should you not have the same level of income uh, for that, you know, first year, maybe 18 months out. And uh, uh, really the bank will help you with that assessment of affordability and whether or not your plan is realistic based on other vet practices that we see other industry stats that we have, you know, if you're, projecting that you're going to be doing something that really is we haven't seen that before or we feel it's aggressive we'll be the first ones to tell you that um we don't want to lend you money unless we know there's a high likelihood you're going to be able to repay it but even in today's high interest rate environment um there still is a reasonable amount of affordability there as long as you're pragmatic about your plan realistic about those expectations and also you don't need to build a palace. <laughs> you want something that's going to look nice, be functional. And if you have extra space to expand, once you need that capacity, you can buy that extra equipment and it likely a higher level of affordability, two, three, four years down the road than in day one. Um, the more 
frugally you can build out that practice, uh, the more money you'll have for marketing and the less debt you'll have to repay, uh, uh, you know, keeping it a little bit more affordable there, even in a higher interest rate environment. Um, I think everybody is anticipating that we're not going to see interest rates go any higher. I think it's probably a, a whole nother debate on whether or not we'll see interest rate cuts in the near term or the midterm. But uh, uh, yeah, we're still seeing uh, uh, practices start up um, successfully, and we've had a great experience with that. Yeah, uh, just to add to that, sorry, I got uh, Zoom froze I took on your me. Question. But, <laughs> yeah, no worries. Uh, uh, I'm back, and uh, yeah, it's just to touch on Ra what Ross said is this: you know, you you build for now, but plan for growth in the future, uh, right? You, you you know, you don't like he said, you don't want to build the palace. Uh, you won't have that critical mass right at the very. Uh, start. It takes some time to build up the critical mass to get to that point where, you, you know, you're going to start turning, you know, a, a decent profit, right? So, and marketing is a very key part of, uh, you know, building that awareness of, of your practice. And I'll go back to Shannon's point is, you know, engaging in the community. That's how you're going to get that visibility, you know, uh, doing a soft launch too as well, just before the practice is opening, um, you know, having, you know, a, a warm and inviting space and, uh, you know, to Shannon's point also is just building that dynamic team that, uh, you know, is all, everybody's all on that same page. And that's what really going to help that your new practice be successful. Thanks so much, Romel. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of other questions that came in that are more specific in terms of the financing. Um, one of the questions was, what kind of percent upfront would you need to either start a clinic or buy in? And how long does it take to arrange financing, if you don't mind addressing those? Yeah, for sure. That's uh, another great question. Um, so uh, our goal is to finance um, veterinarians up to 100% financing. So that uh, means 0% down for you. And uh, Ross mentioned this earlier too as well. We have to make sure the cash flow is right, that it will be able to support that debt that you're going to take on. So we aren't going to give you, um, you know, a $5 million loan if, uh, you know, the net cash flow that you have is $100,000, because that's not going to be sufficient enough to, uh, uh, to pay that loan and even pay yourselves and pay yourself, you know, uh, all any uh, all other expenses related to the practice so we will make sure everything you know aligns and that's why uh, I said earlier engage your bank as soon as possible so we understand what is affordable uh, once again we want to work with the veterinarians to try to get them 100% financing on that practice and then there are times when you are buying an existing practice that uh, the vendor will ask or the broker will ask for a, a deposit on that we will also include it in that finance reimburse that deposit that you've put down. We wouldn't subtract that from that financing uh, for you too as well. Uh, we will also finance 100% of that owner-occupied real estate. That's the only that's the only industry in the bank that we will do that for. Um, you know, no one will get 100% financing on real estate. As long as you're occupying more than 50% of the space, uh, our goal would be to try to get you 100% financing on that commercial real estate too as well. Yeah, I'll add, I'll add to the second part of that question, uh, Ravel. Thank you. And and I think um, the second part was how long typically does it take yeah. for financing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I would say typically uh, once we have all the documents that we're asking for, uh, you're looking at about, and once you accept the, the financing proposal for us to go ahead, you're looking at about four to six weeks. Um, and that's a wide range. Um, there are situations where it can be done sooner depending on the closing. Uh, however, those documents are required uh, to be submitted so we can actually proceed um, to obtain the financing uh, final approval. But um, again, it, it, it's, I think it's an entire process us, it's not like a one in hand done. Um, so it's understanding your situation and, and the deal that you have. So working with us closely would be, um, I guess, uh, we'll kind of let you know along the way as the file progresses and um, keep you in the loop. And then the lawyers will need an additional around five business days, give or take, um, to process and execute the security for finding as well. 
super helpful. I've got a couple of other really good questions I'd like to hit on um, before we finish out here. One of the questions comes from a um, veterinarian who is a solo veterinarian. They currently have a mobile vet practice and they're wondering how they will know if they can afford either an assistant or a brick and mortar location. So what things should they be considering? Whomever feels maybe, comfortable. Maybe I'll take that one. Um, that's where having a team of experts to help you do that assessment uh, is your accountant, number one, your banker. If you've got that critical mass, your revenues are increasing, it makes sense for you and you can convey uh, uh, that it almost becomes a need at that point uh, with the right financial projections based on the growth that you're seeing and those needs that you're seeing from not having a, a, a physical bricks and mortar premises or additional employees. Your accountant can help quantify that. Your banker can tell you whether or not that's reasonable to what we've seen in the industry. And uh, it, typically it would be no different than if you were, say, a manufacturer who got a new contract or needed to buy new equipment. If it makes sense to you, uh, typically with the right help in getting the numbers put together, it will make sense to the bank and something that we can definitely address uh, uh, helping you get to that next step in expanding your practice or getting that physical bricks and mortar uh, location or adding capabilities and staff accordingly. Yeah, I can say as a solopreneur um, over the last 10 years, I and most entrepreneurs, I think, would say this. We always wish we had hired somebody sooner to help, even if it's a virtual assistant to help with booking or client callbacks or um, some of your marketing or whatever it might be. There's so many options now um, for hiring good help. And it it really is often it's that, am I making enough to, to do this? And, and it's just about sometimes just jumping in and giving it a try and then seeing your business grow from there. So um, such a good question. The last question, um, I'm going to direct this to Shannon, but everybody can answer if you've got some suggestions. Uh, the question is, are there any particular resources, for example, books, courses, trainings recommended to learn more about ownership and how to prepare for it? That's a great question. I do know that a lot of the regulatory associations are trying to help um, with materials and different things like that when it comes to starting your own practice. Um, but I do know of one person on this particular uh, webinar who would be very, very good at giving resources, um, and it's actually reviving vet medicine with Dr. Marie here. Um, so there's there's lots of um, there's lots of resource. And here's the thing: this is like for us people that you know we are like networkers like crazy. We know tons of people in tons of spaces, that kind of thing. If you're not sure and you just need help, reach out to one of us and we'll give you a hand finding the right people to connect with. I find it's really important to have somebody that's like-minded um, and that understands your goals, first of all. Um, and yeah, I mean, we're we're looking to put together supports um, for helping uh, female entrepreneurs as well. So um, Marie and I have a great network. We'd be happy to help you. So and yes, um, Tom, you know, he's in this chat here too. And he's, he's talking about, um, you know, different things that he's been helping with, with the operations perspective and stuff like that. Um, you know, there's a lot of operations junkies out there. We'd love it. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to share just a couple more slides um, before we finish up here. And I'm I'm definitely seeing a lot in the chat around, you know, this feels so overwhelming. And, you know, what exactly is this very first step? And where do I go from there? I, let me just say that there is no exact framework to do this. I know a lot of practice owners um, who have who have taken different first steps and, and then, you know, um, called other people into their network. So I don't think you have to follow a path of first, I must speak to my accountant, then the bank, then the business plan. 
you know, it's, it's all of these go together because you are going to need support from so many different individuals. So, um, if you do feel really stuck and overwhelmed, I 100% suggest just starting by reaching out to the person or individual who feels most accessible to you, who you see a little bit of yourself in, who you can identify with, who you trust and start the conversation there. And they will surely be able to point you in the direction or link you up with other individuals that may be helpful for you. So I am so happy once again to, I'm grateful to have the sponsorship of TD to do these sessions for you. You've got email addresses of all of our panelists here. Please, if you are thinking about this at all, take the first step, reach out to somebody and go from there. And I think that can be um, a, a wonderful first step. I also want to let you know that the conversation is not stopping here. I've had some questions come up in the chat around what about selling the practice and, and you know, how do I not burn out when I'm running this practice on my own? We have more sessions to cover this. So on May 9th, um, myself and Sarah Lane from TD will be talking about owning a practice. How do we thrive? So how do we set those boundaries? How do we take care of ourselves? How do we avoid burnout? How do we establish a support system, a network, mentors, and so on? So please join us for that. And then in June, on June 5th, our third and final session will be on retiring from practice. How do we transition? And we will be weaving through throughout all of these sessions, of course, the well-being aspects, but most importantly, those financial aspects as well. So I am just mindful of the time. I'm going to end our session there. Um, Can once I throw again. in one quick thing, Marie, if you don't mind? Sure. Um, knowing that we we're on a webinar here and we have a national audience, I just wanted to let everybody know whether you're in Prince George, Calgary, the greater Toronto area, uh, Quebec City, anywhere across the country, we have a team uh, that stretches across all geographies. So if you are not in the greater Toronto area, don't hesitate to reach out to one of us and we can align you with a person more locally to you to offer that advice that you need to get to that next step. So back to you, Marie. Sorry about that. That's it. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care and have a wonderful rest of your day. I Thank will be you. sending um, I will be sending out the recording uh, to everyone who registered. So if you would like to share that recording with a friend or a colleague, please do. And if you have any questions again, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. We hope to see you again in May and June. Thanks, Marie. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Marie. Thank you everybody. Thanks, Marie. You're Thank welcome. You. Take care. Take care. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Thank you.